Hello and welcome to Speaking with Survivors, a Your Region This Week special. I would like to begin by acknowledging that this program is being produced and broadcast on First Nation lands in four communities that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. In the Stratford, Perth area, we would like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. In the Guelph Wellington area, we would like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Atawandaran neutral peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. In the Brantford Brant area, we would like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada and Haldeman Treaties. And in the Waterloo region, we would like to acknowledge the Haldeman Tract, traditional territory of the Neutral, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada and Haldeman Treaties. Behind me is the Mohawk Institute Residential School. The school opened in 1828 and was the first facility in the national network of Canada's residential school system. Up to 200 Indigenous children would attend this school annually. Many of the children came from reserves throughout Ontario, including Six Nations, Skogog and Saugeen. But some of the children came from as far away as the Ganawage Reserve in Quebec. Today, we will speak with three survivors who attended the Mohawk Residential School. Let's head inside to your Region This Week's Dave Carroll with our guest. Hi there, my name is Dave Carroll and welcome to Speaking to Survivors. It's my honor to be able to be here with Roberta Hill, um, who is a survivor of the Mohawk Institute and we're sitting in, was the cafeteria when you were here at, at this school. What is it? What does it feel like to be in a place that probably holds some terrible memories? Well, it looks so different now. Um, when you're a little kid in here, we didn't have all of this. There was no cafeteria, so it was just this dining room, but it still brings back the memories of being separated, even in the dining room, from brothers, you know, sisters, boys on one side, girls on the other. So that I remember quite well. You couldn't visit with them, couldn't talk to them, even during mealtime. As we're walking in, we're noting that the floors are the shiniest that they've ever looked, and, you know, you, you probably spent a lot of time here in the last little while as uh, the focus of the nation has turned towards residential schools. What does it feel like coming back to this place? Well, there's a lot of unhappy memories for sure. Um, you know, but I, uh, even with all the unhappy memories, I remember some of the good memories and that's just being able to play with some of your friends, you know. There were times where when you were left alone or you could play on your own, then those were the good times. But when there was you know, discipline or, you know, sometimes harsh discipline, then that's not so good. Um, but yeah. I've seen, I've seen where, where you've, you've been quoted saying that history needs to be told by the people who experienced it. And there's a lot of history within this piece of property. Why does history need to be told by the people that experienced it like yourself? Because then you can get to the truth. I mean, if you get somebody else writing your history and they don't want to write the truth, then what good is history? It has to come from all sides. Who is involved in this history? It's not just residential school, in, you know, like indigenous children that is in this history. What about the churches? What about the Anglican church? What about the government, Indian affairs? There's a lot of people that were involved in this over the years, over the decades, you know? So yeah, get to the truth. Ask the people who, who um, ask the ones that lived here. It was part of our life. Do you remember the day that you came here? I do. How old were you? Six. I was here in 19, February of 1957, and the reason we were here was because my mom, my dad had died in 1954, my mom had gotten sick, and there were still seven kids at home under the age of, I think probably under the age of 12 anyway, 11 or 12. Um, and she just had a breakdown. She was sent away to the uh, Ontario Hospital in uh, St. Thomas and we were put here 
six of us were put here. The littlest one was sent to the uh, Lady Wellington Hospital in Oshwegan because she was sick. But when we came here, we were automatically, like, once you're in, admitted, you're put into the, um, we were anyway. Um, they used to have a nurse on staff, so we had a, a, an infirmary on the first level. So that's where we stayed before we actually came down to the basement on the girls' side and met the other kids. You, you came with family. What was the experience of having family like at the Mohawk Institute? Well, the thing with that is, is that you don't get to stay with your family, though. Um, when, when I look back on it and think about it, out of all of the kids that came here, like, there was four sisters. Um, the oldest one, they had their little... Um, this institution separated us even then, not even so much like from your families, from your community. Once you walk in the doors, the boys are on one side, the girls are on the other, right? So you don't get to mix and mingle, you never get to play with your brothers. And even within the girls' side, one of my, um, all, the, all the new kids had a, an older kid assigned to them, and they had to look after us. And I've talked to, she's still around, my friend that uh, looked after me, but she said, no, you were, she says, I couldn't take two sisters into my group, into, in with me to look after them, not even two sisters. She said they just would not allow that. So they were separating us even in little groups, you know. So when you look back on it, there was, it's that division all along from community in here, brothers, sisters, family, like, for what purpose? Well, that was going to be my next question. For what for purpose? For what purpose? Why? Because they could. And I think it goes back to the old question, uh, or, or the, the actual intent of the school. The intent was to assimilate, right? To, to um, they want you raised in what their belief system is. They have to change you. Why they had to change us? Um, my, my firm belief is it's all about lands and resources. You get rid of the indigenous people and their way of thinking, mm -hmm. Start thinking like them, and that you're not going to fight with anybody. You're not going to challenge anybody about land issues, resources, that kind of stuff. So yeah, there was a there was a big purpose for it. What yeah. age did you leave the school? Ten. Went to um, well, out of the out of the six kids that were here, they all went to foster care on the reserve, except for me and my sister Dawn, and then my older sister that was here. Um, I don't know what she did wrong, but when I was here, I just remember them telling me that she was a bad, she was a bad girl, and they were sending her to the juvenile detention center. It was a, a training school for girls. But years later, I found out what happened, and I'm, I don't know what she did, but she ended up in um, the minister's office, who was also the administrator, right? He was the Anglican minister and the administrator. And the two girls that were sent there, he made the one girl pull her pants down and stand half naked in front of him while he strapped her. When it came time for uh, strapping my sister, she wouldn't have none of it. She, he came at her, she gave him a boot, sent him flying, and she ends up in juvenile detention. You have to go through those court systems here, and they say, you're, you're the bad kid, you're, you, you know, you're unmanageable, incorrigible, whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's the, it's the children getting punished again, and for what? For defending herself? He had no business asking any female or any male to pull down their pants policy at the time was you could strap on the hands. We knew they could strap our hands, but anything beyond that was, it's just unacceptable. It's an assault. How long did it take you to process as an adult what happened here at the school? Probably most of my life. <laughs> Probably most of my life because most of us, when we left here, we stayed silent. We didn't talk about it. Who's going to believe you in those times anyway? Nobody would have believed us. They would have believed the minister. The minister said these kids were bad. They would have believed it. It's us who were, it's us who were looked down on and that we were, you know, we were just bad kids and needed, you know, needed all this help and needed to be in these institutions so that they could train us the way they wanted them. How have you been able to find healing? Oh, I found, I found out um, as things, I think when residential school stuff started to really heat up and the residential school survivors started to talk about things and then the more you talk, the more you... Uh, it brings up those memories, right? So you have to look back on those old memories, and it's not an easy thing to do because I spent all my life trying to not look at them, mm -hmm. you know, because mine is being sexually abused by the minister. Like, who wants to look at that, you know? I, I certainly didn't, but it becomes kind of like a poison in your system. It, it can be pretty damaging, you know, and it was making me angry and upset and the more I thought about it and the more I start hearing other other survivors talk about it so I knew at least then it wasn't just me 
there was a lot more. There was a lot more because here it's a pretty secretive place. I didn't know all, all these other kids were getting abused. I thought it was just me. Even today on this show and in the room we're sitting in, there's a number of different survivors. What happens when a group of survivors get together to be able to process together? What, what happens in that situation? Well, I think that right now, the way we are right now, we've been able to talk about it. So that's, one of the, that's the first step. If you can talk about it, if you can let it out, that's, that's pretty much, uh, that, that helps heal. It's when, you, if, it's when you don't. You keep that poison and those memories, those ugly memories and you know, all those things that happen to you. You keep them inside, it's very unhealthy. But today, we can all talk about things, you know. In a, in a small group, not everybody can. There's still some that I know that said, absolutely not, don't want to even come out and set one foot on this property because they're still in pain. They have never dealt with it. So why do you do it? Why do you talk? Because, it's, because I was at that point in my life where I had to, because I was involved in the residential school stuff with the lawsuit and everything. And I'm looking at, you know, hearing all my friends and other survivors talking about things. And I knew then I wasn't alone, but I had to deal with those things. If you're going to, if you're going to heal or do move forward in any way, you, you've got to do something about your own trauma and deal with that. Thanks so much. We're going back to Anandi. We'll talk more with more survivors in a few moments. The school opened under the operation of the Anglican Church to assimilate First Nations children into European Christian society until the federal government took over operations in 1969. The school was closed the following year and was the longest operating residential school in the country. The Six Nations took ownership of the school in 1971. Nobody knows how many children died at the school. However, following the horrific discovery of 215 unmarked graves at the Kamloops Residential School, British Columbia, a search is now underway here in Brantford. Today, the school sits here in Brantford, Ontario, owned by the Six Nations and operated as part of the Woodland Cultural Centre. The centre opened in 1972, a year after the Six Nations took ownership. The centre focuses on the culture and history of the First Nations and preserves the memories of the residential school to ensure what happened never happens again. In early November, the ground search began. Using ground piercing radar, teams are able to look for any unmarked graves throughout the grounds. To assist the search, the provincial government pledged $10 million for investigations into unmarked graves at residential schools across the province. It will take months to search the grounds due to the fast approaching winter season, but nothing will stop this effort to uncover the truth. Dave Carroll is inside with our next guests to talk about their experience here at the Mohawk Institute Residential School. Thank you, Anandi. Welcome back um, to the cafeteria of the, of the Mohawk Institute. Do you remember this room? Yes, I do. What are your memories of being in this room? Well, it looks a lot different now because when, when we were young and everything, we never had buildings this big and it was all all new to us, but it, uh, the girls were on that side and the boys were on this side, so. I'm here with Roland Martin, uh, who is uh, another survivor of the, the Mohawk Institute. D do you remember the day you came to this place? Yes, I remember the day I came here. My mom was signing us in, and uh, as soon as we signed in, my older brother signed in first, and he got to come down the stairs and at the bottom of the stairs they had a barber there and they cut all your hair off and made you the brush cut, I guess you might have called it that time. And but that's was that's the way we went. Uh, so after she signed my brother in and then I came in and I got the same same thing. We come downstairs and then they told you to go into the playroom and get acquainted with the other kids. And 
What was this experience like? How old were you at the time? I was about nine years old. And uh, it, was, it was quite an experience because I was never, never away from home before. And, but, but there was a, we had a big family. There was, at that time, there was probably eight of us. Or no, six of us. And later on, there was, I had a brother and a sister after I got in here. Roland, uh, earlier on this year, um, the nation took a big gasp when the, when the unmarked graves were found in Kamloops. And, uh, and right now, outside of the walls here at the Mohawk Institute, it's the beginning of the search for the unmarked graves. What did it, what did it feel like as somebody who was in a residential school when the story broke that many didn't know about at, in, in Kamloops? What did that feel like? It was over, kind of overwhelming, and uh, you kind of you used to get stories told to you when we were younger. And of course, we here were here, and we know we didn't know what was going on. Uh, we didn't get the news like everybody else was getting, and we were kind of occupied and they're just trying to survive in here. So when, as you know what, what's happening outside right now, what does this feel like? Is this a, is it a dread? Is it a, what's the feeling? It's, it's overwhelming to, to me anyway, because you didn't expect that. Uh, I never expected to, that happened, but you were told that it happened, but you never realized it because you didn't see it and you didn't hear about it that much. And so. Why is telling the stories about what happened here and across Canada, why is it important? I don't really know why they're so important because we lived through them and it was a different life at that time. And it was, uh, I think we were the native people were trying to make their their way of living in the country and I think that it, it took a lot of uh, changes to get us where we are today. I see you wearing the Every Child Matters hat that uh, we see here in Brantford in this especially in this area all over the place on lawns and on the front lawn here. What does Every Child Matters mean to you? They matter because I went through it, what they went through. So I figured that anything I went through, they went through. So in one, one thing, there was, it was tougher on us because we were, we were poor. I think we were poor, but we weren't, I guess. And, but we always thought we were poor because the white people had everything and we we didn't have nothing so it was a, a little harder for us i think than to getting around in the in the country at that time roland it's an honor to be able to sit down with you and hear some of your stories thank you nandi back to you Currently, the Woodland Cultural Center is holding a Save the Evidence campaign to help raise awareness and support for the restoration of the former Mohawk Institute Residential School. Their goal is to create an informative center on the history of residential schools in Canada, as well as the impact the schools had on the lives of those who attended and the communities it impacted. If you would like to get more information on their cause or donate, visit their website at woodlandculturalcenter.ca. Resources have been set up to help the survivors during this difficult time of remembrance and discovery. For local help in the Six Nations, a 24-7 mobile crisis line has been set up at 519-445-2204 or 1-866-445-2204. Two two zero four. A mental health and addiction line 
is also available at 519-445-2143 or visit snhs.ca. For national help, the Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available at 1-866-925-4419. Let's head back inside to Dave with our next survivor. Thank you, Anandi. We're back in the cafeteria of the Mohawk Institute with John Elliott. John, I've read some stories about you and I hear that they called you the runner. <laughs> Why did they call you the runner? Because I used to run away so much. Mm. I ran away 25, 30 times, I guess. What I 25 saying. or 30 times. That's what it says, anyway. <laughs> I read a story that one Christmas Eve, you were... Every at, Christmas Eve I was here, I ran away. Every Christmas Eve? Yep, right from 1947 to 52. 52, I ran away, and they never come after me. Yet. Wow. Yeah. How old were you when you came here the first time? 10. That was in 1947. September the 7th. I remember that was, I see that date. <laughs> what was it like walking up and seeing those steps that now is a, a picture that well, many of us know this, these steps now? My grandfather had hired a car to bring me and my older brother up and my sister next to me. And uh, we come in and my grandfather signed us in and the boys master took us down through the school. And that we got down to the playroom and he was gone. Me and my brother come outside. My brother said, what do you think? I said, I don't think I'm going to like it. He said, well, let's go. And we took off running like hell. We run about all the way to Canesville and come up the hill there and jumped on the other train tracks and hid for home. And, we <laughs> and but we got home. My grandfather and the guy that he had hired to bring us up, they were still on the other side of the river. They were shooting the <laughs> <laughs> he's waving his cane, he had a cane too. And uh, he used to run the ferry at the, at the Grand River there, down on the reserve. And he'd come over after us and he says, uh, I didn't send you there, he says, the government sent you there. And being 10 years old, I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. I just thought they couldn't look after or something. But till, uh, about 15 years ago, first time I went to, uh, there used to be a bunch of us go to uh, Shinrock, Sault Ste. Marie every summer, in the first week of August. And they had a book there, and it and uh, 10 year segments, and they get your book out, and they, they read all that on. As that woman got out of that, that got that book out, and she looked at she said, oh, he was a bad boy. So what the hell do you mean I was a bad boy? She said, you show it to her, you run away 25, 30 times, you know. I said, ah, oh, that's about right. John, you're obviously a storyteller. Why is telling stories about what happened <laughs> here, why is that important? <laughs> they want to, nobody believes them. Yeah, but, uh, and then she says, it, it's your, it was putting your all numbers. But she said, that, and that's when she told me that I was sent here for truancy by J.C. J. Hill, the superintendent of the schools down home. See, I didn't know that. Hmm. But then I found out, yeah. We all saw what happened in Kamloops this past summer. Mm -hmm. And now right outside the walls where we're sitting, the search is on for unmarked graves here at the Mohawk Institute. What does that feel like to you, the fact that this is happening right outside these walls? Well, it took a long time to get them started. Yeah, but I had always heard, even while I was here, that there was a few, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there's a discovery, how do you think you'll feel? Well, I, I, sure, they'll, everybody will feel better, I, but I don't know how I will feel till they do find something right around here. And then I probably would feel John, last question. What, what do you want people to know about what happened here at the Mohawk Institute? I don't know whether they'll still believe it or not. They never, they, people that lived right, right across the street never believed that this place existed. 
And I don't know why, because I stole her milk bottles and sold them. <laughs> How come they didn't know I was there? Mm. Yeah. And then she has prayed down every Sunday there. When I did go to church, down to the church, they prayed at you down there, you know. But I didn't go too much. But uh, when, you, when you didn't go, they'd call your name out after supper time. You had to go out to the schoolroom there and get a strap on the ass until he got tired. It'd be 25, 30 of us that didn't go. And uh, but that one Sunday I didn't go. And a bunch of us were riding cabs in the cow stable. And just when I was riding a cab by the door, the farm boss come in, they slapped me beside the head, and they bust my eardrum in my left ear. But they took me to Bradford General, left me there for a day or so. Like, mm -hmm. John, thanks so much for sitting down and mm -hmm. allowing us to be able to share in the stories that are so important. I could important. tell you stories all day long. I believe it. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Anandi, back to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dave, for introducing us to Roberta, Roland, and John. Thank you all for sharing your experience with us. The residential school system throughout Canada impacted communities forever. They tore families apart, they put children through horrific situations and destroyed their innocence. This is something that should never be forgotten. As of November 2nd, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has registered 4,127 children who never returned home from residential schools in Canada, with possibly thousands more unknown. As we reflect on a horrific period in Canadian history, please take the time, research your local Indigenous peoples and the land of theirs which we occupy. Thank you for watching.